Thank you, man. I wish the light switch was up front. I, would, I could stop asking you to keep doing it. That'd be awesome. I have to put a funny request in for that. <laughs> to, well, we can do that too. To estimate the parameters that we're interested in estimating, we use what's called a confidence interval. How many of you have seen in a Gallup poll the word with 95% confidence? Using 95% confidence. You've seen this tucked around in Gallup polls. We use confidence intervals. I tend to call those CIs just because it gets, it gets annoying to type them. I spell them wrong frequently. The level of confidence in a confidence interval is tied directly back to Lindsay's question about that Z, margin of error in the Z. If you look back to the previous table of the critical values, whatever percentage you pick up from the critical values, whatever percentage you pick up from the critical values, that is the confidence of your interval. So if you let Z be one, you're only picking up 67 to 68% confidence. I want to come back to what that means momentarily. If you use Z equals two, and just so you know, technically speaking, it's 1.96, and you might see that in your textbook. We round it off to two and call it good. Two standard deviations or two standard errors picks up how much area out of the curve? 95. 95%, which means it's 95% confident. That's what you see in Gallup polls. So essentially, that margin of error calculation from our pennies Z was two. Z was two for our calculation. And I encourage you, if you're interested, and you don't have to be interested, run the numbers through that square root. 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 260 square root times two. You'll get roughly your 6% that we got. Please, Rosie. How do you know that Z was two? Because we set, I'm going to show you that when we get back to the technology. We, we, we picked it on Thursday, but we kind of picked it by default. We didn't change anything, and the default is set to two. And we'll come back to that. That's a great question. Hold that thought. Please, Kaylee. Didn't a couple people in class say that their Z was set to 1? Like one or two people said, well, mine says 1. I thought, I thought it was 0.95. Or if they, yes, no. Well, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll mess with it here in a second. Okay. We'll mess with it in a second because I think that's important. Yeah. If they did, I, I missed that. I heard somebody say, it's mine's at 0.95. I said, don't worry. It's set up to deal with that. We'll come back. I promise. I promise. Because that is too. That, this one is two. We had it set because we you actually pick the confidence in your TI and then it knows what number to put in that multiplier. Is that, is that fair to you guys? These are good questions. I'll make sure they get answered. Yeah. Now, what does confidence mean? What does what does 95% confidence mean? Can we be 100% confident? Can we, can we what do you think? Can we be 100% confident? No. Impossible. Why? You can't spin all the pennies. You can't spin all the pennies in the world, so you never get the, param the parametric value. And even if you could spin most of the pennies, most of the pennies, you still can't make Z be so big that you pick up the entire curve. It's a direct relation of the curve having 100% area, and you can't get all of it. So you can't be 100%. So what does 95% mean? What does it mean? I have a really nice, well, this is gonna, I'm going to answer this three prompt. Number one. Your entire second project is devoted to just this question, which I love. It's an Excel-based interpretation of how to figure out what 95% confidence is, number one. Number two, I've got a beautiful write-up on the arithmetic page of the website. I'm not going to bother making a video for it because the video will make it more confusing. Let's be standing in front of the camera talking. I don't want to do that. Here's the third. Here's what I want you to think of. What it means is if we do this experiment that we just did 100 times, so if I make you each spin a penny 10 times, call it the results, create a confidence interval. Then I say, go back and do it again. Call it the results, make a confidence interval. Go back and do it again. Call it the results. If we do it 100 times, what it means is in 95% of those 100 trials, whatever the value we're trying to estimate is, is going to be in the interval that we created. That's good, right? That's good. That means 95% of the time, whatever we're trying to catch, we're going to catch. Which means 5% of the time, we're going to what? We're going to miss it. 
That's why when you guys got exactly 0.5 plus or minus, we're going to be wrong. I like that. We're going to be wrong. I like that. We're going to be wrong because we're going to miss whatever parameter we're estimating. That's why when your guys came on the high end, I said, whatever. I've already got 25 other trials that point at something else. Maybe you guys are just one of those kind. That's why replicated studies are so crucial. The more you can replicate a study, the more snapshots you get of the population, and then you can start to identify the ones that are goofy, the ones that are outliers, They're using a term from 243. Does that make sense? You guys buy that? Ask me questions you got right now on that. If you have any right now, you might not. Please, Rosie. Isn't that kind of similar to the central limit theorem where the larger the number, the more the more, the, the bell curve yeah. and the shrinking of standard error. It's exactly, Will was saying that in the break. Yep, that's exactly correct. It's, it's all inherently tied together. The central limit theorem is the stepping stone from 243 to 244 from descriptive to inferential. It's all bringing, it brings it all together, for sure. For sure it brings it all together. Good, fair, good. Other questions? Anything coming to you guys right now? So that's what confidence means. When you hear the word 95% confidence, it means you're never going to be 100% sure you tracked what you tracked, but it means if you keep repeating the experiment that you did 100 times, you're going to track it on average 95 of those 100 times. That's good. Why wouldn't 99 be better? That's a trickier question. And we'll come back to that as we go through the course. There's a very, very good reason 95 is used. And it has something to do with what I like to call the, uh, the Old Faithful of, uh, of Yellowstone National Park. There's a reason Old Faithful is the most popular geyser in, national, in, in, in Yellowstone National Park. Why? Because they put a parking lot right next to it. Why did they put a parking lot right next to it? Is it the tallest geyser in Yellowstone? No, it's not. Does it spout the most? It doesn't spout the most. When you say most, you mean the highest or most frequently? Most frequently. Neither. Oh. It's neither the most frequently nor the highest. There's one called Texas geyser that goes like 500 feet or something. But it erupts like every nine and a half months occasionally. And sometimes it goes off twice a day. Sometimes it waits five years. It's also not the most regular. There's one called the minute geyser or the minute geyser. I've heard it pronounced both ways. It goes and then one minute later it goes psh. The problem is the psh is six inches tall. So you wait for it, and then it goes psh, like sweet. You go have a bite and come back, and it comes again. What Old Faithful appears to be is the perfect balance of large and regular. It's every like 90 minutes, and it's 150, 200 feet tall or something. It's huge. It's not the biggest, but it's big enough, and it's not the most regular, but it's regular enough, and it's the perfect blend of both regular and hugeness. Just like 95% is the perfect blend of what's called minimizing type 1 and type 2 error, which we'll get back to. That's not, let's not get to that right now. Please, Kaylee. So is that why we don't put like a 4 in our Z or something? Yes! That's why we like to use 2. 2 is the old faithful. 2 is old faithful. And we'll come back to that idea over and over again in this course, because we're not ready for error analysis just yet. Just yet. We'll come back to it in the Yeah, that's why we use 2, or technically 1.96. Fair? Yep. Good. Good questions. Anything else right now before we move on? Please, Jack. How would you construct a confidence interval? Manually? I will never ask you to do it. Manually? No. You, you, that, we, we constructed one last week. That, friends, let's swing to the front board here. Jack asked a very, very good question. How would you... It's my shirt. Can we see the board okay? Yeah. Is it leveled okay? Ish. This is a confidence interval. I am 95% confident. Listen to how I'm saying this. I'm 95% confident based on your sample results that the proportion of heads is between 44% and 56%. Done. That's a confidence interval. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you to crouch them by hand. It's ridiculous. This is too much. This is, this is laden with places to go wrong. So we don't do them by hand. We don't do them by hand. We do them with the machines, and we interpret them when we're done. That's the important thing for me, is that you know what that means. Does this disprove, or when we guessed that the proportion of heads was 0.5, does this disprove that? Does it disprove 0.5? No. No, because 0.5 is right in there. Does it disprove 0.4? Does it disprove 0.4? If, if suppose somebody had guessed, I think it's 40% heads. Does that disprove 0.4? Hell yeah, because 0.4 is way down there. Think about percentage-wise, 0.4 is 40%. The smallest value here is 0.44, which means I'm 95% confident it's not 0.4, because that's too small. 
Just like I'm 95% confident it's not 0.6 or 0.7 or 0.8, I'm 95% confident it's right in the middle of these two numbers somewhere. That's my confidence interval. Is that fair, Jack? That's a fantastic question. As a matter of fact, I, I, I kind of predicted some of those questions. Grab one of these, friends. Rather than make you write all this stuff down. Here, go ahead and slap these around. This is a little, a little uh, in-class data set that I grabbed. Uh, it's a little bit dated. It's about a year or so old at its most recent. So it's getting dated, but I think it, it proves the point that Jack is asking for you about. <laughs> I want to make sure we answer Rosie's question and or Kaylee's. And I forget who asked it about the 1 versus 0.95. Good. We're going to get that answered right now. And I want to re-answer Jack's question. How do you construct these confidence circles? Thank okay, you guys all got one. Jack, you need one? Yeah. Hello. You guys all got one? I think I made too many. Thanks. So I've got January 2010, April 2013, February 2013. Just tracking real estate data over time. Okay. First question I have is, and this was drawn from, I have the sources down here if you want to, if you want to back check them yourself. Any one more? Or a couple more. Here we go. Oh, you got it. Okay, let me get one more. Sorry, Rosie. Sorry, Justine. Here we go, here we go. Everybody got one now? I'm sorry. Okay. We drew a sample of homes back in Bend in 2010. And this was when the foreclosure boom was booming, unfortunately. And I drew, I drew 702 homes for sale randomly from the, from, the, from the registry. And I found that 65 of them were in foreclosure. Now, a number you often hear in the news is what the foreclosure rate is. What the foreclosure rate is, okay? If you had, to, based on that sample, if you had to tell someone what the foreclosure rate was in Bend in 2010, what would you tell them? 9%. Say that again. 9%. You would not, would you? Would you say 9%? How'd you do 9%? <laughs> Michael, how'd you get 9%? 65 over 70. I love that idea! Michael took, he said, first of all, do I have a simple random sample? I, I drew it for you using random numbers. It's okay. Yes. It's okay. It's a simple random. I drew it. I, trust me, because I use random number generator because I'm a geek. So, yes, simple random sample, check. Is it binomial? Is there one of two outcomes for each house that I select? Actually saying yes, I'm tempted to agree, foreclosure or not, good. Fixed sample, 702. I didn't say keep drawing houses until we get 10% or 11%. I said just 702, it's why, I don't know why I chose that number. Is the n times p big enough? It is, it is. We'll come back to why momentarily. Okay, so the question is, what do we report as our answer? So the question, 9% is a perfectly valid response. But when, when Michael said 65 over 702, right? Yeah. What did he just give me? I think it's behind me on the board somewhere. It's in a couple places on the board. He told me 65 over 702 is 9%. And what is that? Yeah. P, say that nice and loud. Who was that? Give it to me again. Yeah. Thank you, Will. P hat. What's the problem with reporting as P hat as your as your, you're, called, you're, you're, you're basically saying P hat is P. So you're saying the population of bed houses proportion is the same as the sample that you drew. What's the problem with that, friends? We just saw it with the, with the pennies. Margin of error. The margin of error, it might be different on a, sec, a second sample. So how do we adjust for it? You guys just answered it. Construct the margin of error. So we have to do this for those values. Please don't do it manually. This is why we have technology. Right? We're going to grab technology and do this. Let's swing this over here. We're going to put it right in the middle there. And this, we're going to go through the steps to make sure that you guys know how to get this, this menu. Who had the 89? Somebody's got an 89 in here. Danielle, you're going to go to intervals instead of, so it's the, it's the stat menu. You found that bad boy? You tested intervals. Go to intervals and find one prop Z in. I think it's called the same thing as yours. If, if it's not, we'll run back there and find it for you, okay? Okay, us with the 83s and the 84s. Stat button, yeah, cool, awesome. Stat, uh, is it called that? I think it is called one prop Z, yeah. Maybe it's not, we'll come back and take a look. Stat button, tests, tests. Scroll down until you see one prop Z int, mine is A. Blue, blue F2. Blue F2. 
to do about your second function model. TFD dash second up here. You're cool. All right, and now we just set it up, please. Oh, I have to put this on your machine. Do you have time during office hours tomorrow? If not, we'll figure it. Email me, we'll figure it out. I have to install it on your machine that doesn't have it. Cool. Put in our data. 65, 702, is that right? Yeah? Yes. Now, right here, the C level is the confidence. How confident do you want to be? It's probably set at 95 from before. If yours says 0.95, that's totally fine. It, it, it'll accept either one. Totally fine. <laughs> Go ahead and hit calculate. Now, I noticed the 9% that Michael gave me. It's right there. 9.3% if you want to call around to the nearest tenth. That's P hat though, isn't it? That's P hat. The answer you should give is the percentage of Ben Holmes in foreclosure in February 2010 is between 7 and 11. Yes, 7.1%, 11.4%, or 7 to 11. How are we going to round that off? I'll tell you what the round is. Don't worry about that. So between 7.1%, 11.4%, you see? Can we guarantee it's at 9.2%? Can we guarantee it's at 8%? How do you feel about 6%? Can you say anything certain about 6%? We're 95%. We're 95% sure it's not 6%. Because the lowest the interval goes is what? 7.1. So I think we, we, I feel more strongly about 6% than 8%. Because 6% is not in there. Which means I'm, I'm fairly confident, 95% confident, that it is not 6%. It's higher than 6%. As far as 8%, 8% is just as valid as 9, it's just as valid as 10, it's just as valid as 11. Anything in that interval is, 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 is valid as far as I'm concerned. Is that believable? You guys buying that logic? Fair? Good, 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 good. Let's just, just, just to experiment a little bit, because I love the fact that we have technology to do this, change the confidence of your interval, go back in there, stat tests, one prop Z. Sorry about the goofy language they used to get used to that. Change the confidence to something else. Like for example, why don't we change it to 68%? This would only be one standard error. Before you press calculate, unless you already did, in which case don't worry, what do you think is going to happen to your interval at 68%? How is it going to compare to your last interval? Think about that. Think about that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Good. Let's find out. What happened to it? It got smaller. Smaller margin of error. The margin of error was two standard errors. Now it's only one. Now it's only one. Likewise, if you increase confidence, it's going to get wider. So if you increase the confidence, say, to... If you increase the confidence to say 99.7, this is now Z3, this is now three standard errors, you'll notice it got wider. Now from 7.1 to 11.4, now it's 6.0 to 12.5. Please, kid. But is that because if you're going to list the margin of error, someone you don't want to tell someone, I'm 67% positive it's this. No one's going to. That industry standard is 95. You offer anything unless we're going to laugh at you, first of all. Right, okay. Secondly, the problem, though, is if you go higher than that, we can make this go as high as we want, and eventually our interval is going to be so wide, it's essentially meaningless. I'm 100% sure. Right, I'm 100% sure between 0 and 100%. It's like, well, great. That doesn't help me at all. That doesn't help me narrow it down. So that's the, that's the balance game. That's the, that's, the, that's the old faithful game we play in statistics. And 95 seems to toe that line the best. Will, go. Oh, shut your head. Sorry, I'm amphibian. I see motion. Fair enough? You guys buying this? Everybody get the machines to work, work for you? 89's working? Beautiful. We'll get the 86, I promise. I promise. So you decrease the confidence level and it gets smaller. Yes. Yes. And conversely, if you decrease the sample size, it gets wider. And if you increase the sample size, it gets smaller. Does that make sense? Think about why that is. Mathematically, we mentioned it earlier, because of where n is in the denominator, when n gets bigger, the whole fraction gets smaller. And to hit on that, look at the next two bits of that quiz. Look at the next two bits of that little, not quiz, the little handout that I gave you. It says a random sample of Ben Holmes now in April 2013 shows that 163 homes out of a sample of 1,734 are in foreclosure. What's the foreclosure rate now? What's the foreclosure rate now? And I say now, I mean April 2013. I guess then. Okay, go ahead, give, give it a whirl. 
See if you can figure it out. And change the confidence back to 95%. And pretty much just leave it there at all times. Every once in a while your textbook has you mess with it, but I honestly don't think it's a good idea to mess with it at all. I think you should leave it exactly as it is. 95%. Okay, so let's go with real estate. Let's see what this of a confidence interval personally. That's why I gave you that little number line at the bottom there that you can draw on if you want to. So this is what the 2010 foreclosure rate would look like spanning a percentage number line. Zeros down here somewhere, or hundreds up there somewhere. That's 2010, which is 7.1% to 11.4%. Probably a little bit further. How about 2013? Roughly 8% to 10.8% roughly. Okay, somewhere in there, right? Here's the problem. The news media is going to say that foreclosure rates are up in 2013 to 9.4% from 9.2%. They're going to say that. It happens all the time. Because P hat in 2013 was 9.4%. Remember what P hat was in 2010? 9.2%. And they're going to say that 9.4% is an uptick from 9.2%. And what are you going to say? No. Why are you going to say no, it's not? Good! It's not statistically significant. Because what do those two confidence intervals do to each other? Can you prove using those two intervals I just drew that one is higher than the other? Can you prove one's lower than the other? Might they be equal? Here's the problem. Somewhere in these intervals lives the parameter you're studying. Somewhere in the interval. But you don't know where. This purple one, it might be right in the middle, but it might also be down here, and it might be that up here. This red one might be down here and might be down here. So if they're like this, then you know the red one's higher than the purple one. If they're like this, purple's higher than red. If they're like this, they're equal. What's the problem? The problem is, you don't know where they are. You have no idea where they are. So the best thing you can say is, I can't decide what happened to foreclosure rates between 2010 and 2013, at least based on those two points. Rosie? Can you not judge it too because of the fact that the two different studies have two different numbers of samples? That's okay. That's totally fine. Rosie got a good point. They had two different numbers in the sample drawn. That's just because I had, I had better, I, had, I was able to get more data, I had more time. How is it, how are the different numbers uh, indicated in the actual intervals? Can you catch how they're indicated? How can you tell one of them has more samples in it, more data in the sample? It's narrower, maybe. It's narrower. This guy has more data. It's shrunk down. Same confidence, 95% confidence. The only difference, I mean, essentially, if you think about the margins of error, these three numbers are essentially the same. 9.2, 9.4, whatever the rest of it is, 90.6. This is about two. That's the change. That changed from 702 to 11, whatever it was. And that's what made it shrink down. Take a look at the very last one on there. Meanwhile, sales of home in the foreclosure process rose 4.28% to 4,600. So now these are, these are sales of homes in the foreclosure. So these aren't just houses that are out there for sale. Sales of homes, okay? How does Oregon's overall foreclosure rate compare to just Ben? So I'm treating these as equivalent percentages. 4,600 homes out of 50,000. Shall we take a look at that? Let's take a look at that confidence interval. Forty-six hundred out of fifty thousand sales. Okay. Here we go. Once again, once again, what do you notice about the interval? 
about 9%-ish, up to 9.5%. Why is it so skinny? Why is it so skinny? 50,000. Because your sample size is 50,000, right? Your orders of magnitude more houses in this sample than there were previously. Can we decide anything about the, 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 the foreclosure rate of Oregon versus Bend versus Bend 2010? They're all overlapping each other. I, can't, I can make no distinction whatsoever if one is higher or lower than the other because they're overlapping each other. Yeah, okay. Oregon's are all in here. The whole state of Oregon's are all in here. So I'm, I'm confident it's between 9% and 9.5%. That's very, very narrow. That's very, very useful, isn't it? The problem is, the problem exists in the fact that what is bend in 2013? Is it down here? Is it up here? Is it right in here? I don't know. So who do I say is higher in, in 2013, bend or Oregon overall? Do I have to pick one? No, statistically you can say I'm unsure. I can't decide. That's a perfectly valid thing to say. Perfectly valid consideration. Is that fair? So often in the news media you are given these certainties, these certainties, these certainties. There's nothing certain about statistics. It's called probability for God's sake. Right? I mean, think about that. 